So I'm happy to introduce uh, Stacy Pomeroy and Sasha from the Agency of Natural Resources, and they are going to do a demonstration of a river flume, and uh, in the in the wake of uh, Tropical Storm Irene and so many um, damages that were happen happen to communities, uh, I think this is a good illustration of uh, how we need to try to better manage our rivers. So, um, and I think uh, Stacy and Sasha would like us to gather around and, and, um, and Okay. <laughs> maybe, maybe. He's on a precarious location. <laughs> so, welcome to the Flume. Uh, this is one of the state's education outreach tools that we do to help us talk about river dynamics and work with communities and municipalities and other folks around talking about river dynamics and planning purposes. Um, one of the great things about the flume as it's getting set up here as a flow um, is it allows us to recognize three very important components of rivers. They transport water, sediment, and debris. Most often we see the water that's being transported but we miss out on the sediment and debris. And so the flume will really help kind of demonstrate the dynamics of those um, processes, especially the sediment and the water. So now we're up and running. I can turn this down a little bit. That one is. <laughs> it sure is. Definitely. All right. In, ca we're in, in, in case you're wondering, the material you see here is actually ground up plastic and it's less dense than sand and rocks, so it responds better to the flow that we have here. And we have this reservoir down at the bottom that. Um, it's full of water, but there's a pump there that pumps it up through a tube along the side and it comes out that clear cylinder at the, the top, which would be uphill, <laughs> and then as it flows downhill, it comes down through this hole. So that's yeah. what you're seeing. So right away I, I, I hear a few comments happening of the house over there looks a little precarious. Um, some erosion processes happening. And what the flume allows us to do is kind of think on a scale um, that we can see things happening at and have a discussion that we don't generally see happening at the larger river scale. Oh, oh, oh. So this is a good lead-in. Um, this is all floodplain. Yep. Um, this is more similar to a, a, an alluvial river, a, a, a low sloped, wide valley type of river, uh, fine grains. Um, so um, it, we, have, we don't have examples of our steep mountainous type of streams. This is more of our valley bottom streams that this really helps represent. So one of the things to remember is a stable river is not a static river. It moves over time and it needs to move over time. And we see when we have encroachments in the way that when our river moves, those items become something that we need to feel we either protect or we need to manage the river in order to maintain them in those areas. So the rivers program also often talks about fluvial erosion hazard. Um, and that's really the area that the river is moving around over time to adjust its slope to accommodate that water, sediment, and debris that's provided to it from its watershed. So people, when we think about the flooding that happened this past year, in May we saw a lot of people getting their feet wet. Some deep water, especially at the lake, there was a lot of deep water. Uh, Barrie experienced some pretty significant flooding in town. Um, we saw a little bit of erosion hazards happening, but really it was when Irene hit that we saw some very dramatic changes in the river's locations that we hadn't seen in, in maybe the May floods that happened. So we saw both inundation getting your feet wet and erosion hazard, the river moving over time, happening in the types of floods that we had. Now, as 
As we see this happening, um, you can see point bars kind of beginning to set up um, in those locations where on the outside of the bend that's our typical erosion area happening and on the inside of the bend that's where typically sediment deposition happens in these type of settings. And if we let this run for several hours just at this speed we would see over time this would move across this entire system. And Sasha's busy keeping up with the sediment at the downstream end. So we can see it really moves sediment. So um, as we're looking at this and we're thinking about protecting this home, what are some of the tools we typically think of in our tool bag for protecting something on the riverbank? Riprap. Yeah, rip rip rip. Yeah. So we want to snag our little box of riprap over there. <laughs> Sounds good. Right. All right. So we have. We have riprap here. Okay, everybody can see? So, um, when we think about protecting our bank, do we typically think about just protecting our land, or do we think about protecting the entire section of the river that might need protecting? Just the house. <laughs> so, it's challenging when we're thinking about these processes. We're often, and especially when we think about with municipalities and landowners, we typically are in the purview of our boundaries. Whether it's our town boundary, our road right away boundary, or our property boundaries. But our river doesn't necessarily respect or know those boundaries. You know, your, your parcel is here, but the entire bank is at work on this side. But let's see what happens. We're just going to protect the house. So they invest in some riprap here, just at their little corner that they have. And what do we see kind of happen right away? Do people notice anything right away? Redirects it to the next place. <laughs> <laughs> Right? So we might have, oh, and we lost another one. We often end up focusing on one location and we miss what's happening someplace else. And there goes another cliff. Um, so we do see maybe some shifting of the energy from where it was eroding on this bank being moved downstream to another location. And the reason that this kind of happens is because we're changing the boundary condition on the bank. And you can do this in a few different ways. We'll do some vegetation here in a second. Basically, all, right now, all of this material, the bed and the banks, is erodible at the same level. The, they're both sand for our context. Drive me crazy. Fix the house. Fix the house. So we'll move it way back out. They were clever. They, they did a buyout. They, they moved back. When we use riprap, or we'll do some vegetation, what we're doing is we're changing the boundary condition of that bank. We're making it more resistant to the erosion. This is less resistant, that's more resistant. For the flow and the size we have, this rock is able to withstand the erosive power. But what happens is as soon as the water finds another spot that's less resistant than this, it's going to erode that because it has a little more power to do it because we stopped the erosion happening in this location. Are you, are you ready for a flood or, or should we? Uh... Sure. Sure. All right. Right. So we'll see what kind of happens during this little flood event in our riprap area. All right. So of course Sasha's going to be really busy. We have a little slope from this floor too, so we're getting a little... But you can see scour kind of happens along the toe of it. Oh, how well riprap is... You can, you can, you can deflood if you're filling up down there. Um, where we are losing houses and trees more. You can also see, notice how we had been, our meander had been out here and now our river has kind of shifted. So over time we do see those meanders move downstream as the river kind of works its process through the system. So Sasha has just provided me some fill here. <laughs> Oh, safe. Oh, you didn't want yeah. the cow. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Save the cow. <laughs> Poor cow. Save the cow. Save the cow. So our 
our bank has kind of stayed. We, we transferred, transferred some of the problem maybe downstream a little bit. Good installation of riprap is critical for its success. And it is not a long-term solution in that it will not necessarily last forever. So it is an investment that we have that does have a lifespan. It does provide us time and opportunity at this location for protection, but it doesn't mean that we might not have to do maintenance and repair and other things at this. So we need to understand there is there's a cost and an investment. What's our Isn't other option? That similar to trees and vegetation as exactly. well. Exactly. Any of our any of the projects we do, we always need to consider maintenance, long term, and our objectives. It's often we think about the project, but we we don't often think about the maintenance and the long term objectives. So it's important when we do these types of things how they tie into those. And also you have to look at the entire Yes. Watershed. Yes. If, if we're doing something here and it's going to have a devastating effect someplace else, we might want to know about it. Or if, we, if we're going to do something here and there's something else happening upstream that could impact us, we want to know about it to make the su most successful project we can. And that's part of probably most of you or many of you have worked with Gretchen Alexander or maybe even Sasha here on some of the river assessments that have taken place in this area and some of the corridor planning. So looking at an assessment of the watershed and then thinking about what are strategies within that watershed for planning purposes, projects and things. If we think about um, another type of bank protection, we can think about vegetation. And again, it's, it's thinking about those boundary conditions. Um, who here gardens? <laughs> okay, really, I just weed. <laughs> I, I like to think I garden, but I think there's more weeds than really vegetables. But when you pull out those weeds, what do you see attached to those roots? Soil and dirt, right? And they hold on for all of their worth. Let me tell you, those little weeds just, they're there. So what vegetation does for us is it's changing our boundary conditions in a slightly different way than the rocks are. Basically, it is becoming a binding agent for our soils. So right now, this has no binding agent. It, it, it falls apart. Now my little vegetation here doesn't have roots, so it's not gonna bind it together, but if you think about what the roots are doing in the, in the soils of your garden, they're binding that soil together. So vegetation on the banks does the same type of thing. It, it will bind the soil together through the root network. That's, the, that's how it's changing part of our boundary condition. The other aspect that it's changing is it's providing a roughness factor on the face of our bank. So as water is flowing over it, the velocities are slowing down. It also is providing a, a slight barrier to the soil itself. So it helps keep some of the velocities away from it. The other thing it will also do is provide uh, habitat, um, shading, and it also helps with wick water out of the bank. So as trees transpire during the day, they're pulling wa water and moisture out of the bank. Um, so they provide a, a boundary condition, but they're actually affecting the soil. Our riprap provides boundary condition, but it in no way contributes to changing the soil characteristics. It's simply like putting a Band-Aid on your cut. It will keep it from bleeding, but it's not gonna do anything for, for healing the cut. Vegetation is kind of like adding the neosporin into the band-aid. It, it, it actually helps kind of heal and, and provide something that in, into the system. Let's go back up there. So now if Sasha turns her flow on up a little bit, we'll just see how our vegetation holds up here. So why is erosion hazard something to be a attention to? Okay. So what are the challenges in our little community that we have here? If, if you think about, in this context, we, we have a built environment. We are, 
we're obligated, we have houses and a road on this bank that the river has moved around to. We keep moving our houses out of the way. <laughs> on, on this bank, we have a railroad and we have a few houses. And, and again, the river has moved such that now we, we need to address it in some way if we want that investment to stay there. It's important in a community when we're thinking about that long-term planning, are we able to provide the river an area that it can move around that we have less or no encroachments in? And that's part of the corridor plan um, erosion hazard. Uh, most folks are familiar with the National Flood Insurance maps. Um, of, of looking at what does it mean for both getting your feet wet and for our river moving around. What are the other things that we put in our rivers? Do we want to ever get across our rivers? <laughs> we never cross the rivers. Never. <laughs> never. never cross a river. <laughs> so do you have a little... Uh, like flood debris to me. Oh yeah, so we'll, we'll pass some of that in. Do you have a little gray one? Some of these fun things. Yeah, some of these fun things. Do we have a bridge in there? Oh, there we go. Okay. We got uh, we got a couple squares. Yeah. No, oh, oh. Oh, well, okay. We'll come back to it. All right. We got we got some we got some items to choose from here. Options. What often drives our our decision making when we're looking at structures that we want to purchase? Cost. Convenience. What's on hand? What's on hand? Cost. Uh, what was there before must work now, <laughs> right? Um, in some ways that can be true. In other ways, it's something that we invest in because it's a short-term cost, always provide us the long-term benefit and cost reduction that we're hoping for. So sometimes something that is inexpensive upfront can have longer-term costs that we don't factor in. And this is often true of structures. Um, and part of that is because most corrugated metal culverts last 25 to 30 years. A concrete structure can last 25 to 75 or longer. I, I have a 1925 culvert um, on our land under the railroad. So they're a long-term investment. Um, and so when we think about that cost, we have to remember that long-term aspect of it. But in this case, let's say this is, this is what we got, and this is what we could afford, and this is what we're going to install. So when we work with folks, we consider the ordinary high water, or that channel bankful condition. What, what type of width does the channel have from top of bank to top of bank? And if I look at this channel, it's very wide up here. It's a little narrower in here, but still pretty wide. I'm averaging probably six or eight inches. I have one inch. Okay, I'm, I am severely undersized. But when we have looked at culverts and structures across the state, it is not unusual for a structure to be 75% less in width than the channel width. Okay? So let's see what happens in this. So I come and I'm going to snag some of this nice material that Sasha has put here. Okay. Now there are a few things. I do this with road crews and we talk about a whole bunch of things. But what do you kind of see right away that I have done with this culvert that's not going to make it very friendly to the river? It's digging deep down on that side. It's digging deep down on that side. How, how about the way that the river has to get into the culvert? It's kind of awkward. Right? Yeah. My road went this way. But my river is trying desperately to go a different way. So our angles are often hard at our structures of how they get in. What do you also, this is where compaction is your friend. <laughs> our, our roads were not meant to be dams, but a culvert is, a, is acting like a dam with a small hole in it. So when we have flooding events, come to the lawn. <laughs> we are asking our road to be a dam when it has a very undersized structure. Oh no, we've lost our tractor. Along with the <laughs> so what do you notice that's happening uh -oh. with our sediment in our water upstream? Scouring. It's flooding, it's impounding. Oh, we just lost it. Sasha's going to be really busy. <laughs> you, can, you can stop flooding. <laughs> Quick! 
Right. We actually saw this happen a lot in Irene. How many communities here had some row that failed but the structure sat there? <laughs> right. And what, what did you guys, what, ha what typically happened after that? Did you change the culvert or did you just come and put more dirt back in on the other side of the culvert? Put, we put dirt back. We fixed the damage. We fixed the damage. And, and often that's because, um, here, I can move some stuff up front too. <laughs> um, we have um, FEMA, our funding sources are not set up to replace the structure even though it's, it's undersized and it caused damage. They're, they're set up to get us back to where we started prior to the event, which is not any better than what we were, but to that point. But, but what did we see happen at this, this structure that facilitated the loss of this road? Now, now this was inexpensive when we put it in, but how much was it to repair the road, right? And what happened upstream? We, we saw the impoundment of water happening upstream before this failed. And in some instances, those structures influence or change the flooding that happens upstream of them. So because the water is impounding until the road either fails or the water overtops. So if you have a large encroachment of a road fill across your floodplain, you can impound a lot of water up behind it if your culvert is not able to pass that water, right? So this guy may not have ever got his feet wet, by just the dynamics. But now suddenly the undersized structure influences the flood heights. Or if we got debris jammed in that structure, suddenly that structure is influencing the flood heights behind it. So our structures are often a culprit in flooding that we could potentially do something about. It, it, it involves planning, it involves money, Money. Money. It, it involves changing our strategies of where do we need to consider priorities in our community for replacing structures. So it might not always come down to the culverts has been there 25 years, we want to replace it with the same thing. It might be, it's been there 25 years, but every five years when it floods, we get a st storm, we have flooding issues around it. So we want to change that not only because the structure is getting old, but also because we want to address flooding issues in it. And that's going to drive maybe what the design would be. So in this case, I, I up my size. <laughs> A lot. A lot! And I bury it. And again, I put my road back. Now. Do I still have challenges at this site? Yes. yes. Right. We did not solve everything just because we went to a larger size. We still have an odd angle it's got to get in. We still have a road encroachment. And we still have flooding considerations with the structure. So comprehensively, when you look at the structures in the community, what is it impacting? And what, is, what do we gain when we change something? Or what are the challenges we still have to fight? Sometimes it's always on the outside of a bend. It's odd angle. That's where our road is. But, but you want to take those aspects into consideration. Any thoughts as to why I buried it? The critters through the bottom. Keep it down. Critters through the bottom. Help keep it down. Yeah. So I'm getting much better through my structure. My road encroachment is still failing. <laughs> okay. So in this case, I might need to look at head walls, right? I might rip wrap. You might need right. So it becomes a larger, comprehensive package of what you need at the site than just what the road and the culvert can provide. So the. The burying, yes, because we want aquatic organism passage to move. A fish does not see this structure here. But also think about when the stream bed is moving up and down vertically, with this buried some, it allows the bed to move some without affecting the structure. So it's a little bit of a buffer for that movement in the stream channel that shouldn't affect our structure. 
What other types of damages or events did folks see from Irene? What are some of the, the challenges that have come out of it that folks are interested to talk about? I'd be interested in talking about where there's really narrow channels that don't have for I mean, uh -huh. um, you know, where, and that can happen like if you had rip rap here and here. All right, let's and, try that. And that, that was where we saw a lot of those. Like Moortown at the far end going towards Wakefield. Okay, so is that because it's historically been channelized and rip wrapped on both sides, or is it just naturally no, a narrow? It's naturally, it's, it's yeah. stumped yeah. on both sides. Okay. Yeah. So what happens when we don't have floodplain through the area? And that's a challenge, right? So my little rip wrap box is right here. Okay. So in this case, not only in this not only are we saying that the river cannot move from side to side. Montpelier is another good example, right? right? The city, Barry City is a, another very good example, mm -hmm. where um, we have asked the river to squeeze through either naturally or man-made constriction. It, it's not able to move, and in the case of uh, some areas, it also does not have the ability to get up on its floodplain. So. We're asking all the water and sediment to get moved through that section. And what happens to the area downstream? This becomes the location where the river is going to try to release its energy. The next place it has floodplain or area to drop out its sediment, it will typically do so. <coughs> Because think about it, water, sediment, and debris are with the river is moving, but it's slope that is going to drive how fast the water is moving and how much sediment the water is moving because of, just like when we drive on a road, if you're going downhill, you can take your foot off the gas and you can con continue to move. When you hit that flat spot, you take your foot off the gas, you stop, right? The river's functioning in the same way. The slopes, it's able to move stuff along, it hits the flat spot, it's going to take the momentum and natural current to kind of keep the stuff moving, but that's typically where we see stuff drop out. So what happened in your area? What was the, what was the area you saw? Was there damage and then, or, or was the area downstream that you saw? Well, what I think <laughs> happens the most times is that this gets so full uh -huh. that the river decides to do something else very suddenly. Right. And that's that's where you get like the river cutting through here, or you saw that. or just um, and that, and, or else just plain old getting too deep, and and uh, it has to have more height. Right. And so it, it just overcrests stuff, and then it can carve new channels and stuff. Right. It, it just decides to go outside of those banks somehow once it gets so big. So. It's not easy to demonstrate that, except if I'm gonna, I can put a little culvert in a little block here, and then we can kind of fill this up and we can see where the water goes. You wanna see how that works? Sure. Yes. Water likes an easy route, just like most of us. <laughs> Ready for the flood? Flood conditions. Flood conditions. That was such <laughs> now, Sasha, you, you visited or saw this type of event happen in one of the communities where it historically had, had carved down through a canyon and then during Irene it did the same. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So because I have kind of a pervious dam here, it's, it's not quite doing it, but you can actually over here, it's choosing another path. Yep. And now, <laughs> now Sasha's going to be really busy. <laughs> oh, down it goes. We spoke too soon. <laughs> Even good culverts can, can fail. So what are we able to do at those locations? Hold <laughs> out. Well, you can't move the city of Montpelier. Right, we're not going to move the, the city of Montpelier. The first thing you have to do is start those islands that lost the 
hawks come up against them. Get them the hell out of there and dig it out so that it's deeper. So what is... But what that's, is so, that's so environmentally incorrect, I don't understand it. Okay, no. Although, because other than, uh, what happens is we saw, then you're doing severe damage downstream. Right, so, so there are a few things. So if we think about making a river deeper to provide more flood capacity, how deep do you need to dig that river to get a benefit on your floodplain? So if you have a 40 acre floodplain with a foot of water on it, how much channel capacity do you need to maintain that same amount of water? It's scary. <laughs> velocity of the water, yes, discharge equals velocity times area, volume. So we we have to understand what what would our what would our goal be if we if our challenge or our option to dig the channel deeper was to relieve flooding. So who who and which flood area are you able to relieve and and what is the type of channel that you would actually need to hold that capacity? And and I I don't know to be honest, right? If if we saved this floodplain, right, from flooding because we have a community, whom downstream must now hold those floodwaters? Because our section of channel may hold the floodwaters, but their section of water may not hold the floodwaters. So we need to also think about when we when we ask a section to no longer be a functioning floodplain, where does the flood water go that used to go there? It it has, it has to, to go, go somewhere. somewhere. Right? The, the other challenge, so thinking about what size channel you would need, what, which areas would that provide relief from, how, how would you plan for it to be there, where would the water go downstream, and how would you accommodate that. But also when you think about the, just the dynamics of the channel itself is our challenge. In, in 1987, the state said no more commercial gravel mining. And this was a big impact for many people and for many towns who had been taking gravel out of the stream for their work. And it was in part because the Federal Transportation Agency said no more funding to your structures if you keep allowing gravel mining that is undermining your structure. So you fix something, you dig out someplace else and it fails again. So how do, how do we see this play out? So right now you can see water and sediment moving. And I'm gonna come in here and excavate out. What do we notice in the area that I excavated? Starting to fill back. How about downstream? Look how much erosion's happening downstream, right? And, and what's happening upstream? Can you kind of see it in the riprap? Here, I'll do it again, just stabilizing. So just like when we had that undersized culvert, we're kind of creating a change in slope in the channel. And this happens because we dug out the channel, we made the bed deeper in one area and the bed above it is higher. And it's going to try to smooth that slope out. N none of us like to take giant steps, right? We, we're, it's working towards that even gentle slope of the system. And so what we see happen is the person who is excavating at this site may not really see much change at their river. <coughs> it's often upstream and downstream that we saw the impacts happening, more consequence. And, and because when it was happening at more of the commercial, you might have somebody excavating here, and you might have somebody excavating here, and you might have somebody excavating here. And the system was kind of responding into those different conditions. So it's important when we think about that as a tool in our tool bag for flood recovery and discussions of flood relief, where do we want the benefits? Are we able to achieve them with that management strategy? Where do we have locations that that is our only strategy? We have several bridges in the state that are very small, that are in very tough locations and fill with gravel often. Their strategy, because they're there for 25, 50, 70 years, 
is every five or six years they have to come up with a budget to excavate out the gravel in that area. Is it a great strategy? No. But it is the strategy that we have to work with. We also need to remember that because one strategy works in one location of the watershed does not mean it will work in another location in the watershed. Look, look at where Sasha's standing down here. How much change has been happening in this area? How much change has been happening in this area? Right? How about in the middle? Right? So we have some locations in our watersheds that are very, very dynamic. We have some locations in our watershed where that stuff happens, but it's gradual, or maybe when we get a flood, something changes. But it's not anywhere near as crazy as down here. So we, we need to think about, hey, my riprap worked perfect up here. I'm gonna apply it across the board. That is my way to fix my banks. You may not have the same success in another location. So you would need to evaluate the tool that you're going to use in the context of where you are in the watershed. You know, the undersized structure may be on the tiny tributary. Yes, it'll affect your local back road. The tiny tributary on your main stem may affect a very large part of your community. So where, where can you make the changes? What are the areas that you want to focus on in your community to start? Because we're not necessarily going to replace all of the culverts in our communities, right? You have over the next few years, maybe, starting to plan for them. Where do you have bank erosion? That is, you, you have investments. And, and that is the strategy you have because you have the investment. In some cases, we said, oh, it is better if we buy it out We'll go the other way. We buy this out and we let the river have this side. <coughs> we have a road over here, we have houses. We, we are unable to, to give this up. But we, we are willing as a society to give this up. We work with the landowner, we might do an easement on that to help compensate for them. It might be looking at uh, local taxes. Is it, is it like current use or some other way that if the community recognizes that this floodplain, this is our saving grace. We don't ever, ever want this to be developed. That is our saving grace. How do we protect it? What do our regulations say? In many of our town's regulations with the minimum NFIP, we can put a house here. Is it a good place to put a house? Maybe not, but it's somebody's land and they want to have an investment in it. How do we, how do we build up past that? What other things happened in Irene that folks are curious about or we should talk about? You can't be the only person who had it. Awesome <laughs> <laughs> debris. Yeah, that too. <laughs> Do you feel that there are locations now, post Irene, where debris may need to be removed? That's I mean, there are certain spots that look worse than others, that almost look as if they would enhance erosion if more water came. It's a good question. It's a million dollar question. It's what everybody's asking. Because how we have not really seen an event across the state like it, we see flooding every year to some community in a large, in a localized event that may be as devastating to them as Irene was across the state. But it ho happens locally. With Irene, we really ha had a lot of across the board debris questions and issues come up. Lots of material got added to the stream. For the stream itself, this is a benefit, right? It's, it's wood added to the stream that adds to the complexity of the bed, it adds habitat, and it adds long-term structure to the channel itself. Remember, water sediment and debris. So the stream will respond 
to the debris itself. Some cases it will erode some more, some it's going to pile, some of this we won't see again for a hundred years. We've done a couple restoration projects and actually there's a couple sites on the Trout River that the bank is like 15 feet high and there's a tree that's sticking out of the bottom. So that came from some other big flood event, you know, a hundred years ago. The challenge is, do we remove it or do we leave it? When do you think it's important to remove? Well, yeah. Right. When it might be because we have infrastructure that we know will not be able to pass the debris. And it is in an area and it's in a size that it is susceptible to blocking the structure and and it will cause failure or damage. And so maybe if this is our structure location, <coughs> we come and we remove these pieces. Do we need to remove all of these pieces? Depends on when you get your next floor. <laughs> 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 if they're stable, maybe not. <laughs> but isn't it based on quantity also? And what infrastructure is above and below that, that bottleneck? Yeah. I mean, you have to do a total analysis. So you can't just randomly say, I'll take three there and two there if in fact the channel can accept two to three. Yeah, so in in this location... It's crossed up and what? All depends if the debris gets crossed up. Right, 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 right. right. We, we, I mean, like, how involved were you with Route 4 restructuring? Oh, not Route 4 restructuring, but I was very involved in the debris teams that went and actually worked with towns to decide, do we take this out or do we leave it? Oh, great. So, you know, the questions came, how, what can the town afford, right? right. Okay. Because FEMA was not interested in removing debris, right? So there is little to no funding. The NRCS um, Emergency Watershed Protection Program does work with towns to remove debris that are uh, considered um, high impact potential debris. So we have infrastructure or a road or a home that because the debris is there is likely to cause additional damage. And they're looking at about a five year window that they figure if the floods happen within the next five years, this debris is likely to be mobilized or it's of a size and type that it's likely to become an issue. I thought Not, a related question. Sure. Going back to the gravel in the stream. Um, the, let's take the day before the day after I read. A lot of streams got a huge addition of gravel in that yes. day. Now suppose, in, so I mean, if, so if you, suppose you just remove most of the gravel that was new in that overnight, as opposed to going down to the older gravel. What, you know, it seems to me that you, you're not changed. You, you, if you just remove the gravel that was put there that day, which was a lot of it. Right. And a lot of it from, probably from the banks. Uh, and you, and you put, and basically you were putting the stream back to like it was the day before. So um, that that was done in a few locations, um, but again, our challenge becomes: we might be able to focus in this area because we have the resources, but but the stream upstream of that area is not able to have anything done to it. So we might remove this sediment, but this portion of the stream still has its additional plug of sediment, so it's going to work its way down through. So from from a sustained watershed or river perspective, it's too expensive and too much of a challenge to really be able to determine how much of that sediment was new or old. It happens in specific locations because that's that's what we're, that's what we have to manage for. Um, if if we didn't have any infrastructure in the way and the stream got a new plug of sediment, it's going to work itself out with that new sediment. Um, where our challenge is because we have a road or a house or something in the way that that extra sediment is changing the river in a way that we aren't aren't accept is not acceptable to us but you're right we our goal would be to get back to where the natural channel was if we were going to remove the sediment and, and what we found sometimes with the, some of the work that happened was folks saw this little gravel bar 
and they it, I remove this. Well, maybe we should take a little more to make it deeper. <laughs> Pool. Now we have a pool. Not for very long, though. So uh, you're, you have a good question, and, it, and what we're trying to work with folks is when that does have to become a strategy is how do we make sure we, we are getting back to a good channel dimensions that were there, not, not necessarily just removing to remove, that, that we're trying to make it uh, more sustainable. If we circle back around to your, the debris question, so when we worked with towns, it was what type of resources the town able to invest in it? Um, where where are you seeing your challenges? So what what bridges are susceptible to it? What bridges are wide enough that you know it doesn't matter that there's debris upstream, it it's going to move it. And where do you recognize maybe we can leave this in place? It, it's of a size and type that. You know, all bets are off if we got another Irene. But our typical spring flooding and things, it's of a size it's not typically moving. So we can leave it in those locations. And you do need to do, you can't, you want to look at your site, but you also want to look upstream and downstream of you to kind of know, if I remove this cluster, is there one right behind me that I, that I just didn't see? Um, and in most communities, what, what really um, became a challenge was they, well, right of ways, getting landowner permission, uh, debris removal, um, uh, where, to, where to put it, get rid of it, cost of that. And then also um, just kind of having, finally being able to work with their citizens to say, I know it looks messy, there's a lot of wood in the stream, but it's not going to move. It's, it's got sediment structured, it's a size, it's running parallel to the bank. It, it is, in our best estimate, not likely to move. And for the towns, it was just being able to say that back to their citizens. Um, you know, of, of we removed what we could, what we could get funding for. Other ways that we also addressed areas that they couldn't get funding for but the tree was hanging like this. So we went and cut it in three locations or four locations. So the root ball stayed in place, but the size became small enough it could move through the structure downstream. So there was some other ways we could work with the challenge. Of, we didn't have to remove it, we could cut it to smaller pieces or you know, work with it so that it, it, it remained more stable. Historically, uh, I remember it anyway, uh, in Montpelier, there were certain places where the ice would break and you'd get hung up. In fact, they hired cranes to spend a winter there. Yeah. In a few spots. Hardwick often has to hire an excavator to hang out to prevent flooding. I ice is a big challenge in Vermont. Um, and gravel bars and debris contribute to ice issues. So that, that two factors into the discussion, are we susceptible to ice jams? And is this debris such that it's causing a jam across the channel? Could be a beaver. Is it, is it jamming up such that it's holding water and sediment behind it and pounding it and if that lets go, it will cause damage. So maybe it's quite a ways from our structure, but because of the impounding factor behind it, it was also looked at for potential removal or cutting it in certain areas for relief valves, basically. Areas that could, 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 could um, escape. Dan, maybe you could comment on some of the debris work that uh, we've been doing <coughs> well, in Central Vermont. Sure, I mean, well, we were all part of the state's effort to go out and map debris and stuff like that, and, um, you know, we didn't have as nearly large a pile of actually woody debris uh, as a lot of towns had. And, you know, Northfield had some debris, you know, Roxbury did as well. In the end, it was far enough away from structures that they only removed the stuff that was really, like, like so close to the structure that, you know, it was necessary to make, have passage. Um, the Plainfield has one particular bridge, two bridges actually, that are uh, quite a problem. Um, and they've got, you know, the Great Brook, and it's, you know, it's almost 
<laughs> you know, it's crazy how much debris and sediment was flushed down, and that was during May. Um, you know, so they still got stuff. In the Can you yeah. tell us, and do you have analyses that go back enough to project the general flow, absent an Irene event, over a hundred year period, how wide a range of a, a river flows? Left to right. Oh, you know what I'm asking? I, I think in so. In other words, it comes yep. here in 1990. Sure. How many years before it's here and does it return back? Have studies been done yes. to talk about? Yes. What is it called? Morphology. Thanks. <laughs> Good word. <laughs> um, yes. So, as part of the watershed assessment, it is looked at to see where the river has most frequently moved and been. And when we think about those corridors, that area we want to work with communities on to think about their planning, we want to understand where that is. Okay. Um, and if anyone's interested in Love's Old Maps, um, there's a great link for the Mississippi 1940s historical topo. And you can see, you wanna talk about a crazy river that's moved everywhere. The historic meanders of the Mississippi are just amazing. Really? Yes, Isn't I'll- like 20 miles wide Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's phenomenal. That's really, that's close to All the way, all the way. The, they have the entire entire river system mapped and it's it's just someone hand colored penciled you know it's very cool it's very impressive yes Head, headwaters in Minnesota yeah you can step across and then you get down to it it's miles wide um, so yes, historical understanding where the rivers moved historically helps us with guiding. Some, sometimes we see old meanders. Who drives the uh, interstate you know, along the Winooski and you see um, the old oxbows out in the fields, right? So when we built the railroad, it was, you know, you don't want to go around the meander, you cut through the meander. Um, you know, and then our road got built so we cut through it even more. But we, we can see evidence of our own ways of changing where the river has gone. And sometimes during these flood events, the river decides that that doesn't really matter. It's headed back to its old path. And we saw that in a few instances where it captured old channels um, historically. Um, some on the other side of the road. <laughs> you know, think about Route 4. Uh, it, it, it was headed back for where it wanted, right? Um, Let's see, what other types of damages and things? Well, yeah. general, more general question. Sure. But when you're when you're having these discussions about these protection measures and, and rehabilitation and whatnot, um, could you talk for a few minutes about the difference between normal everyday flooding that we see most every year versus Irene, where it's realistically cost prohibitive to build to a stand? Sure. Um, so if you just talk about that for a couple of minutes. Okay. Because and, and you're really having two different discussions here. You're having a cleanup discussion versus a prevention discussion. And the, the prevention discussion is not going to cure Irene. No, um, no, I mean, Irene so was what, for, yeah, for most 300 folks. 300 year storm or something, I, you know? Yeah. Um, Sasha could probably talk a little more about climate change considerations. Yeah, I was gonna say, I'm um, sure it's a shorter period of time that we'll see another event. Well, it's, it's really complicated to say that Irene is a so many, hundreds of years event because it really varies depending on where you are. Well, the 100 year thing is a misnomer anyway, but... Yeah, I mean, but it but it was yeah. big, right? Right, it was big, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, um, and how we use the land affects how quickly the water gets to the channel, where it um, builds a lot of energy. So, as Stacy was talking about, places where we've built really close to the river and there is no floodplain anymore, there's going to be more power in that spot, regardless of how what size flood event you're talking about. Um, but yeah, so climate data is showing that in the northeast we're getting more heavy rain events, more extreme mm -hmm. precipitation events, maybe not necessarily the annual precipitation being greater. So it's possible that we could see more extreme floods, whether they're the size of Irene or not. We don't know, um, but Irene is a good way to kind of 
do a gut check, right, and say, are there things that we should be thinking about? Um, but for, you know, uh, the, the channel forming event, which is every one to two years, um, that, that flood event can be actually quite harmless as long as there's space for the, the river to get up on the banks. If you have places where the river hasn't been able to get up on its banks for a long time, either because someone straightened the river to make it more powerful and it started to, to dig down, or because um, it's there's just not space because of buildings and so on, then those those areas are going to be um, still problem issues even with that spring flood event. It's usually in the spring. The the guidance for structure size is um, generally bankful width, so the the width of the bank to bank, or about 1.25 times larger than that, and that's usually accommodating our spring events, our annual to biannual in Vermont, when we have those events. And um, uh, so we're, we're not trying to ask people to accommodate in their structure size a 500 year event. You know, that's, that's a floodplain. That's what our floodplain is for. Right, we're, we're looking for the, the structures to pass, to be the size of the channel to pass those type of floods that we have on a more regular basis because we have them on a more regular basis and those are what are forming the channel because it's happening on a regular basis. I mean, if you think about a 100 year event is a 1% chance in any given year of that event happening. You can have three or four of them in the same year. It's, it's statistics and I'm not a st statistic person. <laughs> but, but, but when you think about community planning we're just trying to get folks to kind of think about we need to go from this size to this size. We, we need to accommodate the width of the channel itself and if we can provide any extra room for the channel to move because we can make a little bit bigger structure we're gaining ourselves some extra benefits from that. Not only fish passage and all those but a little bit of room for the channel to move without affecting our structure. When we're talking about development in the watershed and near the river, we are trying to get people to think about not only our yearly events of where we're seeing things happen, but the large events where, where we don't typically plan for because we're like, oh, that's a 500 year event. I'm not, I, I won't, I'll never see that in my lifetime. How, how do we work in the community to recognize that, that there is a risk in those areas? Well, isn't the standard philosophy that it's cheaper to rebuild than to build it to withstand that event in the first place? You can, you can rebuild it every 100 years cheaper than you can build it to withstand a 100-year event. When your home has been washed oh. downstream... That doesn't... not much comfort, I get that. I don't know if we can withstand... We, we, we can build to withstand. I don't know if we can. Exactly. Yeah. Can you even do it? Can't, yeah. It's physically impossible in a lot of instances to build to withstand a hundred-year event because the whole thing's underwater anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So maybe we shouldn't be. Maybe we shouldn't be building there. <laughs> or maybe we have to recognize that we we have to have a different strategy. So take the Waterbury complex. I guess part of the discussion there is that when they put some of the office buildings back, the lower levels will be parking. Right? If they get, if you move the cars and it floods under the lower levels, who cares? Who cares? It's wet, it's dirty, you clean it up. But your offices have now been protected. If, if you're talking about homes or businesses, how many businesses in Barry flood every few years? Many. <laughs> All right, right? I work, uh, this is not my region, I work in Lindenville. I, I'm, I'm dealing with one of the communities that has one of the highest repetitive loss. In, in the community for flooding that happens frequently. So there was a meeting with our businesses in Lindenville to talk about what are the steps you can do for the regular flooding that we incur. Can we do flood proofing, dry proofing, wet proofing? Where can we raise some, some locations? It was, um, we can raise, we have a tall building like this, we can raise the floor a foot so we can get ourselves above the flooding. So there are steps and things that we can do for especially the regularly occurring flooding 
that we, we are seeing frequently. And then for those type of events like Irene, we need to identify where we have hot spots in our community that if the event happens, we are going to lose this road, right? If we lose this section of road because we have that event because this culvert blows up, can we get to the community? Where do we have emergency access issues? Where do we have long-term, you know, those are the things that you can take charge of. You can't take charge of that 500 year flood event, but you can take charge of if this culvert fails and my road washes out, do I have somebody on the other side that has to get out? Uh, we had one community, uh, there was all over the news of not having access out. We had one community, they had to go all the way out, all the way out, all the way out, all the way out around to get to the other side, right? Because one culvert blew out, right? So when we're talking about the community and putting the culvert back, he's like, I have to put it back, even though there's not much for houses up this way, but because when I do my snow plowing, I can't go all the way out <laughs> to get back over to this road. Right, so it, it's, it's those type of steps and that type of information that we can work with communities to do better planning for. We're not gonna prevent the flood, we're not gonna make this house resist a 500 year flood. But we can recognize businesses that are getting flooded frequently and take steps to prevent them. We can recognize houses that are most susceptible. Do we buy them out? Do we help make them more sustainable? The poor person who's gotten flooded here, in many instances, cannot afford something different. We have a lot of low income housing in very vulnerable locations. Uh, one question I have is it sounds like that the, the flood plains are like the, the most neutral solution. Yeah. So here we've got a state of a model where all the settlements basically get along the rivers. And my question is how many natural flood plains are even left? Quite a few. We're actually very lucky in Vermont. We have concentrated development on the rivers. Mm -hmm. our, you know, our, our cities, our, our and we have smatterings of homes, but a good share of our floodplains are in ag resources or in forestry resources or not currently developed. But if you look through many of our town regulations, many of those fields are, are potential Develop. So, so is that going to be a big push by the state now to, uh, to identify and put off limits? No, the state has no no jurisdiction over that. It, it what we what we have jurisdiction or or efforts of is to try to work with the community to recognize the resources that they have and to determine how they best can manage that. So if, if Montpelier is not, it cannot do anything for the river. It, it is what it is. We, we've armored it through there. We have ice jam issues. We have a trib coming in. We need to make sure that upstream and downstream floodplains that are functioning, retaining some of the water, maintain that or Montpelier is gonna have a bigger issue. So how do we do that? We could do it through zoning and regulations. We can do it through conservation easements. We can do it through, there are a number of different formats that we might look at how to protect those resources. The state is buying it. Exactly. There, it, the economic and ecological benefits, we often miss out until the event happens. Because I keep hearing you basically say that the water's going to do what it wants, particularly over longer periods of time, like a hundred years, period of time, it's going to go where it wants. So it seems that maybe the flood plains, uh, what else is there? There, that's, that's one of our key tools in our tool bag of, of building flood resiliency. That's the, that's the key words now, flood resiliency. So recognizing where we have floodplains that are functioning or have the potential to function to provide relief to those areas where we don't have any, any way of adjusting or doing. Working with communities to develop planning strategies for the emergency and recognizing hot spots. And are there mitigation steps we can do? Can we change this culvert from this to this? Mm -hmm. How does that relieve some of our flooding and allow the river to do something? 
So those are steps that we would like to encourage and work with towns and, and, and river folks on. Um, because I think Irene and other flooding that we see on an annual basis keeps showing that over and over again of we we have encroachment and when we have encroachment it means certain management strategies need to happen to maintain that encroachment. We want a house, we have a road, we don't want the river to move. Well when we have both sides happen that we can't allow the river to move, the river is going to find the next spot that it can move and it will move there. Um, so you know I, I, I think um, you know, Sasha and Gretchen work in this region and they may have worked with folks, um, you know, and looking at the corridor plans that have taken a look at the river and said, you know, where are strategies or where are hot spots? How do we move forward for that? It's, My has been a big wake up call. It's the whole watershed. Yeah. Looking at it collectively. Yes. Mm -hmm. we, when when we get caught in those boundaries, this is my land, this is my town, this is my parcel. It, it, it's because that's what we can focus on. Most of us cannot look at the entire system on a day-to-day -day basis, but it also encourages us when we have the opportunity to work in watershed groups to help expand those boundaries. When we do this with road crews, this road crew puts in this structure, this road crew puts in this structure. Want to have a flood? Uh, <laughs> it's about time, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. See a good jam? It's not moving. A little bit through. Oh, my vegetation's catching it. Look how this structure is impacting this structure. You see the impoundment happening? This structure is going, is, is under head now. So my, my road is failing because it's not built to withstand that. We can't afford to build our roads to withstand the, the dams. So I'm just gonna move this because I wanna see the debris also play into this. Keep going. Uh, <laughs> still raining. Still, still raining. raining. <laughs> That's what happened more now, right? <laughs> so sometimes what we what happens when we're thinking about the watershed is things have happened in in a uh, now watch as the sediment starts moving through this culvert again. And it's actually pulling it from the side. I don't have good compaction. Behind it, right. So again, we had that slope change. And our structure affected something else. So when I do this with road crews, we talk about, they have regular road foreman meetings and things is talk about when you're going to be doing different projects because if you put in this culvert and I put in this culvert we're not friends any longer right and it comes true of our private driveways making sure towns have good driveway crossing um, you know one of the things that I saw in many communities was drainage networks were some of the worst damage to the road infrastructure than the big culvert that was in the river because this happened to be a good size and we cannot design our drainage networks again to to accommodate Irene but we need to have our drainage networks be susceptible be sustainable so looking at where we have steep sloped drainage networks looking at how to work towards getting those armored so they can withstand those velocities that are coming down on slopes working at when you have a culvert that's crossing a road and the drainage has to make a 90 degree turn. Do you have head walls that can help make that 90 degree turn easier? Where in your road infrastructure, if this little culvert gets plugged, 
and the water heads down your road, are you going to lose your road? I mean, we had a lot of roads get, you know, four or five feet <coughs> wide, six feet deep canyons because of one little culvert in the drainage network getting plugged. So those are steps that we can take towards building flood resiliency. For common events, our, our local thunderstorm we had on May 29th in Lowell dumped 5.4 inches over the course of a few hours. Wind, rain, hail, you name it, showed up. Lots of road damage. I didn't see anything at my house in Westford. I didn't know there was a big rain event. I had a call, um, can you come help with the road damage that we got? Right? It's like, what road damage? We didn't have anything. Oh, because they got a localized thunderstorm that went through. So it doesn't even have to be a very large event. Sometimes it can just be that thunderstorm passing through that causes the damage. Yeah. So, you know, it, 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 can, it can happen suddenly. It doesn't have to be necessarily that the rivers come up to cause the flood damage. It, it can be those local rain events that can cause some serious flood damage, localized flood damage. I feel like I've been rambling. Are there other questions or comments? Or is this a helpful tool for people to see? Is it? Um, any other? How about storm water? Towns dealing with storm water? I know Barry is. Anybody else dealing with storm water? Really, nobody. No, no towns have any storm water? You deal with it all the time? How do you deal with it? You put it in those culverts to get it out, right? I can tell you what you're doing wrong, why it's all blowing out. Okay, perfect. <laughs> you, you can come be a part of our... I do. <laughs> right? I was up in Montgomery on uh, a couple weeks ago hiking up a pretty steep hill, um, drainage network uh, of the road. Culvert was outlet on a steep bank and then the road foreman walked away. It's off the right away, it's gone. It was a four foot wide, 10 foot deep gully that formed on the other side, on the downstream side. Energy dissipation is our friend <laughs> at the outlets of culverts. Where those pipes get outletted can often cause substantial damage if we don't understand where they get outletted. In Barrie, is there anybody from Barrie here? Yeah. Barrie Town, okay. Part of what we saw in the spring flooding in Barrie was also because of stormwater, right? Stormwater got, there's curbs all the way down the road. The stormwater had nowhere else to go but down the road. And when it got into town, it had nowhere to go, right? Except down the road. And, and because we've bermed a, a fair share of the river, when the water tried to get out, it had nowhere to get out, right? So their flooding wasn't only caused because we had the river come up, it was caused because there were substantial amounts of stormwater that had nowhere to go, right? So it's, it's valuable also to think about your stormwater connections. Lindenville, we actually have a stormwater pipe that when the river floods, it backs up through the pipe and into the community, so it floods that way. So we're looking at ways of closing that, that would trigger when it gets to a certain height so it can't back up. That's also one for homeowners. You can make sure your pipes have valves that close so the water doesn't back up into your house. But stormwater is also a contributor in many of our flooding situations. So even knowing where your stormwater infrastructure is or how it drains off, because if it's draining all off your road and it has nowhere to go on either side, when it gets to the bottom of the hill, where does your water go? Um, so it, it's, it's another factor in our flooding 
um, and our contributions of sediment and water. So think about stormwater as well. It would be very interesting if when you did this demonstration, instead of putting this material back on the board, you put it in a bucket because I suspect by the end of your lecture, <laughs> we won't have very much. There will be a highly <laughs> visible example of how much gets yes. eroded yes. without mitigation. Right. Mm -hmm. right. I would say all that. All this. Yes. yes. On the other all hand. Soil, right? Plastic. No, I know. <laughs> right. I know. But right. we could be rip wrapping the whole thing. The whole thing. Um, <laughs> Well, let I had a question about um, the different types of banked uh, materials that help and where they're best. <laughs> it seems like riprap is really good for certain areas, like <clears throat> high speed, high water volume areas. Right. And then mm -hmm. I, I, I know that in Marshfield in the past we've had different. Um, you Discussions? Know, the pro tree guy and the pro uh, oh. you know, riprap people. And, and it's like it's not really one or the other, though. It's like where do you use it? Right. And, and I've been married a long time, so I compromise. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you're happy to see a little of both? So. Vegetation. She'll never and be a politician. No. <laughs> okay, so yes, the, if, if your bank is 10 feet tall, planting trees on the face of it will, uh, and on the top of it will not save your bank, right? There's some mitigation strategies you're going to have to do first. You need, if it's a vertical bank, you can't get any vegetation to be there anyway, right? If you're trying to protect a house or some infrastructure like a road, you're going to want to make sure the toe of your bank is going to be stable and the more resistant to erosion. And it's very difficult to get vegetation to grow below the water level. So in those instances, we may stabilize the toe with our hard armor because it is the resistance to the erosion. We can get it so, and we want to tie it back into good stable locations, we might have to work with an additional landowner or out of our right of way to make that happen. Then we can reshape this and we can plant the top with vegetation above your high water erosive mix. So then you get the nice benefit of both because you're benefiting the soil up here by changing not only the boundary, but all those soil characteristics that we talked about. And here you're providing a stable toe that will resist the erosion. When, so some of it's going to depend on what you're trying to protect. What, how much land you have to be able to make a slope or not a slope. And if you are able to um, provide enough time for your vegetation to grow. So, if you're wanting an immediate erosion fix, you're most likely going to aim for a rock because you have something here you have to protect. If you're able to, you need to protect it, but you have a year or so that you can let the vegetation grow, then you can have a good combination. And in some instances, like we work a lot with farmers or landowners who are just trying to slow the rate of erosion, we will just reshape it and we'll plant the thing. Because there's, they're trying to protect their land, but they're willing and able to let the erosion happen. They're just trying to slow it down at a rate. So getting the vegetation on the bank will help with that resistance and all of those pieces. But we, where we can, we try to strive for this. You know, because you're, it, you're protecting your toe, but you're providing the benefits of, of the vegetation as well. Because if you just try to do the vegetation down there, then your toe will, yes, right, right. yeah, right. So when we have a shallow bank and we can get a face of it, we can plant, then you'll typically have enough time that you won't get undermined and, and cut and you can get the vegetation established. When you have a tall bank, we typically can't get enough slope and vegetation low enough that we can prevent that scour from happening at the toe. Um, so we, we mix the combination. One, for the person who's doing it, it's a reduction in cost if you're not armoring the entire bank. For the person who's tree friendly, 
it, it provides those benefits that they're looking for while still providing the benefit of the reduced erosion. So it brings up a question that happens along my land along the north branch is they've got a lot of big trees that are being undermined and Meaning? they're going to go at some point. Sure. And I often think it would be better if before they tumble I cut them down so that the root structure stays there and keeps, keeps things stable or because once they go they kind of tear it up even more. So one tree wide is not a buffer, right? Mm -hmm. when the when you only have one tree and it falls over, it's gone. If, if you have a well-vegetated section behind you, then they're functioning together. They're tying all the roots together and all those good benefits. So if the one tree falls over, it's not a, it's not a big deal. If, if you're looking at field typically behind your trees, maybe now you start your planting so you have a, a backup crew. What are you trying to protect here? If, if there's nothing that is in an immediate risk, then I don't know as I would fuss with the trees. It, 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 when a tree falls over in the bank, it will pull part of the bank. That's why one tree wide is not a buffer because there's nothing else to help follow up. And also the the other trees pull down the back of the roots. Yeah. So, but, but in all the, like, a lot of the floodplains and stuff, we have this situation where there's literally a little you know, strip. strip of one tree wide stuff. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, farmland up to it, which is right. what obviously happened. But then, you know, there's nothing, but like in our woods, where there's, a, there's a lot of water coming yeah. through there. You know, the trees just wind up sort of shifting and leaning a little bit more. Right. The backs are so tied in that right. they can't just tip over. Tip over. Um, there's other benefits to trees than just erosion as well. Sure. I mean, it's not. It's not. Rivers do more than the erosion issue, obviously. Oh yeah. There's. I mean, there's, I mean, there's, there's other benefits habitat, to trees that water be, uh, quality. Right. There's, sure. uh, you know, um, yes, there are a substantial number of benefits. Transportation, transpiration, uh, good air, all, shade. habitat, shade, uh, water cooling. Um, you know, so so for yours, you know, I, I think what you need to consider is if, if the trees fall over, is there something on your land that if the erosion really starts, are going to be threatened? And then maybe it does help to cut because you're you're maintaining the root structure, but you're preventing the weight of it pulling out. Um, if there's if there's nothing there, you know that you're you're invested in then probably it's not worth your time and energy. Um, so it's without knowing your site very well. In this case, it's down along the path to go along the river. So right, so, the yeah, I mean, you know, um, but likely those trees, when they fall over, will fall and kind of land and, and land, you know, per parallel downstream and they'll help provide bank protection, mm -hmm. good habitat. Um, and in a system like this where it's a sand bottom, the wood's really critical to providing a mix in the system itself for habitat and, and structure. I mean, think if you were a fish and all you got to look at was sand. You know, the material provides scour holes and some diversity as well. Um, so it, it's a good benefit there as well. Questions, comments? Yeah, in uh, Rochester, my uncle's a uh, slut more down there. And the fish people were cutting hemlock trees and walking, walking them across the river and cable them back to other trees. So they wouldn't go down and all of them flood the all went trees down. wet, along with the ones that are cabled to, and plugged up the bridges and call it. Yeah. I think. I mean, Kind of like uh, the fight with the fish people versus the construction infrastructure can get locked out constantly. Yeah, and it's so black and white though, because there are trees that provide habitat and stability. I mean, sometimes the trees will, yeah, certain certain um, river trees. I just heard black willow is really adapted to dealing with river flows. But what I was going to say is that you know the woody debris you know, the bigger pieces, it can 
actually, once it has a chance to kind of settle in, it can actually hold some of the sediment in place and provide not only fish habitat, but a little bit more roughness for the channel so that when a big flood comes through, there's less. You're right that some will move, but not all. So it's sort of, a, it's not as black and white as that. Uh, when it was going on, they had their doubts about it. Yeah. We should have common sense what happens if we have a flood. Uh, we saw cable back to the other trees. Little trees and the ones that came with them went down and plugged up all the bridges and stuff. That's why a lot of them came had to because that. That was done like four or five years ago. Mm -hmm. It was probably shade fish. Yeah. <laughs> it, 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 the whole thing with the back. It's very happening with it. such a big flood, but it right. just didn't make sense. It really didn't make sense in all the things we've got. Mm -hmm. I got I gotta believe from going down through Route 107 and different places where the flood really ripped you know, <coughs> the, the rivers and stuff are so much wider now than they were before. If they could ever get the infrastructures, bridges and culverts big enough to take the water, mm -hmm. I don't think you'd see anywhere near the damage next mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. right. we can have another I read them out. The bridges are running away. We would have the most damage because it's already kind of spot. Yeah. I think you're right. You bring up good challenges and, and, and things that, you know, we do projects hoping to obtain certain goals and sometimes we, there's after effects we weren't able to, to plan for. And maybe the next time they look to do those types of projects, they'll understand where they are in conjunction to other infrastructure or better ways of cabling them or size. Those will all go into future planning for those types of projects because of because it failed. We learn from our mistakes too. Mm -hmm. um, so, but we don't want it to be a fight over fish versus people. It, 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 it it's a mutual benefit for us to all have a good channel. So, there's a lot to be learned all the way around. All the way around. <laughs> yep. Um, well, thank you everybody for the great interactions and thank feedback. Thank you. thank you for having us tonight. Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. I think it's um, visual, three-dimensional. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. Really, really <laughs> good. Very good. Well. good. Good. Well, I hope it starts some good discussions in, in your group. Um, yeah,